And with that, uh, we are really happy to uh, in, welcome Paul Sonnier, who will interview Alexia Priest and discuss more around the uh, this advent of the, and the importance of business development and licensing with life science companies and digital health startups. Paul? Well, thank you, Stan. <clears throat> A very exciting program again, as always, with the Hit Lab Symposium. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, so my name is Paul Sonnier. Uh, I'm the author of The Fourth Wave Digital Health. I'm also the founder of the 80,000 plus member digital health group on LinkedIn, which I uh, founded a little over 10 years ago, um, responsible for catalyzing the use of the term digital health, which was fairly disused uh, at the time of the founding of the group. Um, I'm also an innovation and digital health SME subject matter expert at PA Consulting. And at PA, we're helping pharmaceutical companies, uh, enterprises modernize and digitize clinical trials and develop digital therapeutics that are truly patient centric. Uh, so today I'm honored to be speaking with Alexia Priest. Uh, Alexia is a senior associate director of business development and licensing global transactions at Barringer Ingelheim, and hopefully I got that correct. Um, so, Bia, you're on mute, Alexia. Uh, so, BI is uh, one of the world's 20 leading pharmaceutical companies and the largest that is family owned. Uh, since its founding in 1885, the company has been committed to researching, developing, and manufacturing uh, novel treatments for human and veterinary medicine. Um, so with that, Alexia, I'm, I'm delighted to be speaking with you. Um, can you please share your background with our audience? Sure. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate it. Um, also, um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the symposium. Uh, I am honored and privileged to be able to share information with you and exchange uh, some ideas of the process uh, through my experience that I had gone through with respect to innovations and lots of them, okay? Um, so I want to thank uh, the digital health uh, sponsors, Columbia University, Stan and Paul for uh, allowing me to participate. I have been negotiating uh, all kinds of agreements, mostly in regulated space for, I'm gonna age myself, <laughs> about, uh, I would say, uh, 40 years. Um, so um, my career uh, spanned broadband, telecommunications, data communications, as well as pharmaceutical. All of these industries are all regulated and they all went through severe growth, like from like zero to a hundred, okay, at particular points in time, which is very difficult to manage it, um, okay? Um, during this, I was able, I, I'd like to share this because I think it's important. A lot of times people think, and I apologize, I have to drink a little. A lot of times people think that, oh, I'm not in this industry, okay? I can't contribute it, contribute to it, okay? And believe it or not, when I started in data communications, I had uh, experience in metals, okay? Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and then I went in from data to telecom, uh, data to broadband and then telecom, okay? And pharma, when I walked into pharma, people were saying, well, you don't have any pharmaceutical experience. <laughs> and so my, my thing was, okay, but once you get the acronyms down, you're all set. <laughs> Cause life is the same, especially in these growth er areas because what you do is you go through similar types of, of experience, but a different industry, okay? Um, something, is it's sort of like something looking at a whiteboard, 
that continuously turns up white the next day. Okay, so you're continually growing and in innovating. And from a quality and understanding of process, because understanding of processes to Stan's point in his opening comment is very important. How is the ecosystem going to accept your innovation? How long is it gonna take? How or are the regulatory people gonna respond? My experience with all this was from a world class um, consulting company headed up by uh, Teichi Ono in Japan. Uh, and so you learn a lot by these uh, simple rules, if you will. Yeah, well, that's fantastic, uh, Alexia. It's an impressive background. And I love, the, I love the transition from industry to industry with the common thread being innovation, as you highlight, and the skill sets being transferable. And, and I'm biased in recognizing that because that's been my experience moving through the as well. We're a kindred spirit, there you go. <laughs> we are, yeah, so fantastic. And thank you for sharing uh, your background. Um, so let's dive into a specific area uh, with BI. So besides schizophrenia and cognitive disorders, what other areas uh, is BI exploring in the digital therapeutic space? Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, it all that information is confidential, okay? So I really can't directly speak to it. But what I can say is that it's recognized, especially in pharmaceutical businesses or industries now, that there is uh, a place and that there is a market that is going to explode that yeah. serves the patient, patient okay? Mm -hmm. And this is important because if you rely continuously on pharma products, you're going to miss the boat. You're going to, I liken it, my, my thought is yes, um, especially in chronic conditions, I believe you're going to see more and more introduction of digital therapeutics that allow patients to help correct the uh, the condition if you will wherever possible mm -hmm. so i think the there's going to be you know I, I get little glimpses about the industry kind of looking at ah do we really want to be so heavily invested in chronic conditions or do we want to play it to integrate a digital therapeutic with a uh, pharmaceutical product uh, and the digital therapeutic would be complementary. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing I'd like to uh, talk about is, and I could be a little bit more detailed there, is that um, when I was in the broadband industry, okay, there was a lot of us who were saying, you know, because we, Every other week, we're going to Japan, Asia all the time. And so we we're saying, excuse me, why are we not? Because we did um, all the interdiction, set-top converters, et cetera. Why aren't we bringing digital over to our company? And we kept on it. And finally, one of the heads who was on the F um, FCC committee said, the infrastructure is not ready. Mm. So they had a transition, even though it wasn't, you know, it was an innovation, we could do it, not an issue. But all the people with analog TVs, what are they going to do? Mm. All the suppliers and all that service around it, etc. Wow, major impact. So I think that's what people were feeling probably uh, pre-pandemic, but then got a really glimpse of, whoa, wait a minute, this is awesome. Yeah, um, you know, and that's a good segue, I think, into the, to what you foresee as the future of digital therapeutics post-pandemic 
uh, and really maybe you can focus on the infrastructure if that's a limiting factor in that regard, or maybe there's other uh, uh, more larger issues that are, are prevalent in your mind. Um, well, what I believe, and this is why this background is here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to hear it's, about it. It's gonna be out of this world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, very nice. Um, and, um, I was first thinking about this myself when I was talking to the company and trying to design um, an infrastructure for, you know, app-based, web-based, you know, for personal patient data mm -hmm. and information. And the reason I did is because by golly, when you have that, you don't have to carry and go and get separate copies, bring them, blah, blah, blah get all your information, mm -hmm. retrieve it, it's right there, okay? And then from a revenue generation, the data is gonna be astronomically important, okay? Um, with respect to the ever-changing environment, especially when you come into the uh, uh, prescription DTXs, you know, last year they had a chain, uh, they changed it where class two, three uh, didn't have to have FDA approval. And then in January, change of administration, it goes back to where they, so this fluctuation is very difficult to handle. Also the, um, you know, if you look at, if a, a pharma player comes into it and you look and they say, um, you know, uh, um, they say, I'm sorry, this this message popped up, so I got a little sidetracked. <laughs> um, okay. uh, yeah, the mess, um, pharma is a very structured group, okay, with long processing time, and they have sequential, we'll start this at this stage, we'll start this at that stage, when you go and bring that into the pharma business, I mean, the the DTX business, that's all gone. You're going to have to be agile. You've got to change your behavior. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to react. Um, and it is you know, a very big challenge. And I think the industry is going through also standards, adjusting standards, what are best practices. I know the DTX Alliance is doing a great job yeah. with that too. So, and I encourage everyone to get involved in both Paul's group and the DTX Alliance. And um, stands, or I should say Columbia University certification program because it really gives you the depth. So when you go into talking about or having to do a transaction or being involved as a project leader mm -hmm. in any space, you get a great overview. Yeah, well, and that all of that leads us into the next question, I think perfectly. Uh, in 2020, last year, UBI entered into a partnership with Click Therapeutics. So a total, totally focused non-pharma digital health specific company providing software as prescription medical treatments or otherwise known as software as a medical device when we think about FDA mm -hmm. and for people specifically with unmet medical needs and when I say that I emphasize that because I think about what you said about digital therapeutics being companion or being totally separate and so I think that's interesting context for why you decided to enter into this partnership with Click. Um, I can't speak directly to that. I did that transaction, by the way, mm -hmm. and negotiate it. But what I can um, speak to is when, when any, any company who is in a different, totally different industry, okay, and you're having to engage all the stakeholders in that industry, who may not and mostly not understand the home market segment, okay, mm -hmm. or how they're going to generate revenue, it's usually like an extreme challenge, right, 
for example, in pharma, the payers don't come into play until later on in the process, whereby you have to have that right up front. So it's a little difficult. Uh, Click was able to provide everything we needed as well as the commercialization of the product so that we uh, could get it really, they could handle the digital, if you will, Mm -hmm. uh, and we can handle, uh, you know, here's the patient information. This is what we're looking at. This is how we wanna serve the patient. And we, you know, I think it's, if you look at it from a complementary, just like the complementary device position, it works out great. Yeah, it, it certainly sounds like the synergies are, are there and you know, you're know you really relying on uh, the, the expertise of your individual companies mm-hmm. and some being greater than the parts. So that's, that's really fantastic. And I'm excited to see how that evolves. Uh, and you know, I think a, a final question I'd like to ask you, Alexia, uh, at Hit Lab, uh, digital therapeutics is of course a trending uh, approach to healthcare. Similarly, my firm, PA Consulting, assists many clients in this area. Can you share a little bit more advice uh, for innovators and startups in this space, perhaps around partnering or or even other areas? Um, Yeah, if you're an innovator on the digital side, okay, it's really good to understand how you're going to diffuse the product into the ecosystem, Mm -hmm. okay? That it gets complicated, okay? And and having that connection, working with people in the alliances, et cetera, these kinds of groups, I think is very important because you learn what people you need to tap into. And you may wanna think, okay, do we wanna partner with somebody that already has those connections, Mm -hmm. okay? Um, So, you know, you can take that aspect of it. Uh, From a pharmaceutical perspective, when you're looking at at wanting to do digital uh, therapeutics, okay, and you're just entering that market space, it's totally different, okay, totally. (laughs) <laughs> and if you think you're gonna just walk in, right, and yeah. say, okay, this is what I want, and puff, magically it appears, not so much. You have to be very diligent. And again, it goes to, you know, understanding what you want to deliver and be really transparent with internally with, hey, we don't have this expertise or that expertise, et cetera and make up for it within part for with partnerships. Mm-hmm. And I think um, Hit Lab does a really good job in really facilitating trying to understand what's needed and you know doing maybe different studies that quick studies that would help. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I really like that Alexia. You know it, it emphasizes that you know informing yourself uh, as to the market. So for instance, you know, forums like my group and the, the information I share, you know, that provides a resource. And then to dive down into the details, Hit Lab um, and Columbia Business School of Executive Program uh, and Digital Health Strategy that Stan leads as well. You know, those kinds of resources, the societies you mentioned are critical. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah. You know, both parties, you're not gonna be able to do it on your own. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, thank you, Alexia. It's been a pleasure uh, chatting with you, and uh, hopefully we get to have more conversations in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Appreciate it. Thanks. Stan? Paul, Alexia, amazing, amazing interview. Thank you, guys. That was really wonderful, and uh, just incredible insight into what's driving the digital health ecosystem and what's driving the adoption and the diffusion of digital in the ecosystem today, obviously highly complex uh, system it is. Thank you both.